What is going on, guys? Happy Wednesday. Hopefully everyone's having an excellent day today. So over the last couple weeks on Ask Reef Dudes, I've had a number of people actually ask me questions all around dino or dino flagellates. So I figured, excellent topic for a stream today. On the line, I have Mr. Cruz, who is an excellent resource in the coral world. How are you today, Cruz? I am doing fine. Sorry, I'm just driving. <laughs> no problem. In the chat, Ravencod, Joseph, Adam Silversmith, k and Reefing, Johan, Ryan, T-Bass. What's going on, guys? A topic that just I happened guess. to me. Oh, Jamie, it's fresh. Fresh one, Jamie. Tim Allen, what's going on? Gabriel, welcome, welcome. Cruz, how's your day going, sir? Uphill battles all yes. day. Ah, <laughs> yes. Just like the battle against Dino. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. So I know most people call Dino like an algae, but it's more of a, like a protist. It's kind of its own beast. And it is photosynthetic, so it does make it a little more challenging. Um, one thing, too, is just how to properly identify it, because I know sometimes a lot of people confuse it with something like cyan cyano or diatoms. Uh, the easiest way to kind of separate them, like diatoms is more of like a brown dusting on your sand where dinos or dinoflagellates tend to be more stringy or you'll see them trap like little gas or air bubbles and they'll be kind of like little bubbles floating on little strings all over your tank. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, if some, I do see people confuse cyano sometimes. Cyano is generally more of a green or a red where dinos is more of like that brown color. So that's kind of a good way right off the bat to kind of do it. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Sorry, just quickly skim the chat. Welcome, everybody that's just joined us. So, why? So, I have seen people shut down tanks because of dino, and that's no fun. No one wants to have to shut down a tank because of it. Um, so, there is ways to kind of battle it. One of the more common ones I generally see recommended is by doing a blackout on the tank. And that's usually people will take something like cardboard and completely wrap around the tank and do a three-day blackout on it. No. Okay, so just actually read in the chat. Uh, Jamie was just saying, I had low nitrates, low phosphates, the only thing that helped when I added a refugium and algae scrubber. Uh, and cleanup crew helped control it. So on that note, with cleanup crew, so dinoflagellates is actually somewhat toxic. So it could kill your cleanup crew. So you don't necessarily want to be adding cleanup crew to it to try and take care of it. Because if they die, this is going to create more nutrients in your tank. Now, on that, another common thing I've found is in tanks where people are, like, overdosing, carbon dosing, or they're doing certain things that may be killing their nitrates and phosphates could almost push you on the edge to have dinos. Yeah, so, exactly. So, blackout is a temporary band-aid. So, it will fix it. Um, it also finds... Because it is photosynthetic, it's one of those ones you'd normally only see in the lighted areas of your tank. You won't necessarily see it in the shadow areas. So it's another way to identify it. Um, another big thing is, too, people will generally try and suck it out via, like, a water change. But that's actually kind of counterproductive. Because if you do a water change, you're adding in those extra nutrients from the fresh water, which is actually going to feed more to grow. So if you are want to suck it out of your tank, it's a good idea to do something like run your water change hose into your filter sock, something along those lines. That way you're recycling your water and don't even do water changes for a few weeks. Like you want to just get that dinos out, but without adding fresh water. It's so another big one. Yep, absolutely. Hey, Lisa. Um, there are a plastic net over my overflow pipe blocking small debris and algae. Is it then possible for the overflow pipe to be clogged? Anything is certainly possible to get clogged eventually. Uh, if you do have something covering your overflow pipe, just make sure you clean it regularly so it doesn't build up with crud or other stuff. Um, okay, so someone was saying they use reef bugs and phytopaste to outcompete and basically wipe out dinos overnight. So, long term fix, you do want to outcompete it. Um, so, certain reef bugs will definitely consume it. There's also bacteria, which you can dose certain things in your tank to up the bacteria and have that bacteria outcompete the dinos, which is more of a long-term fix. Experiment with heavy phyto addition. I don't know if phytoplankton necessarily would outcompete it, just kind of looking through some of the comments. Generally, 
oh. silicates and other stuff. I, I supposedly help kind of bring it out. I've never personally had a big fight with them, so this is going off part kind of other information. Cruz, have you dealt with them directly in your systems? Not directly in our systems, but in uh, a lot of our clients' systems. Mm -hmm. And what's what's kind and, uh, of what's been your magic bullet okay. to, to well, fight them? We do a combination, but uh, the main the main portion of it is to outcompete it, mm -hmm. and then also to have something else consume it. Mm -hmm. uh, consume the dinoflagellates, and uh, yes, we do. We do utilize the blackout method, mm -hmm. you know, temporarily to weaken the dinoflagellate army. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to refer to it as armies because that's, you know, in my mind, that's how we're fighting it. We're mm -hmm. trying to outcompete it by numbers, by sheer numbers, overwhelm it, and then consume it, right? Yep. All right. So A lot of the times we would. You know, we would definitely lower the uh, lower the light intensity. Mm -hmm. We still, have, you know, have corals or very very, you know, sensitive corals to uh, you know to black out. A lot of uh, a lot of people run that very very fine knife sedge, um, you know, on lower pH, and uh, you know they don't do a lot of the bubbling or supplemental aeration yep. as I call it. And um, yeah, so when they turn off their lights, a lot of the photosynthesis in the system just goes out. Mm -hmm. And you're encouraging even more, um, I want to say, more stress on the overall system. You know, more stress equals more carbon dioxide, more carbon dioxide, more waste material, and so on and so forth. It kind of snowballs mm -hmm. on you. Yep. And and these uh, uh, these protists, as you as you called it, what they do is they're opportunistic, and if they have the excess nutrients released back into the water column, they will consume it and they would absorb it. You know, feeding the chloroplast inside their bodies, uh, in you know, utilizing the light or limited light to actually photosynthesize. Mm -hmm. So yeah, basically, keep up the aeration, yep. builds up the bacterial army, and we typically utilize two types of bacteria, and one of them is uh, you know is a denitrifier or it sucks up nitrates and phosphates, mm -hmm. and then you have the other one which is a macrophage or what we call the sludge busting bacteria they basically consume the bacteria they have a large mouth what we call the large uh the macrophage algae uh acrophage bacteria mm -hmm. and they actually consume they actually consume the dinoflagellates depending on what type you're actually dealing with a lot of them can i want to say about 80 percent of them that are identified mm -hmm. can be consumed by these macrophage uh bacteria okay so Riefen was always just saying he ended up killing his by dosing Fritz 460 bacteria and then UV sterilizer to eradicate the rest. Mm -hmm. Um. So when it comes, okay. okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, no, no. I, I mean, once again, the out competition definitely a yep. good one. Um, but there's always stragglers. Uh, we notice. So you actually need an active. I mean. Once again, that balance is very, very fine if you want to actually go out and out compete them. Because they do uh, tend to go into the nooks and crannies. Um, you know, a lot of the dinoflagellates or dinoflagellate survivors, mm -hmm. they do bury themselves under the sand, make their way into the sand, make their way into the, you know, into the rock work, so on and so forth. So it's only a matter of time before they actually come back out again. The only thing that we know that does not need light to, photo uh, to survive is bacteria. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. They multiply based off of the carbon source, which is the secondary energy form from uh, from the sun or any other light source. Um, nutri uh, the nutrients as well, nitrates, phosphates, also come from you know indirectly in a dissolved form of light energy. So it's a secondary byproduct of you know any organics. Mm -hmm. So. Re Reefing with, though, actually just made a good comment. Spoke with Miss Fox, mm -hmm. who examined it under a microscope, and dinos are always in our system, something which mm -hmm. creates an imba a imbalance which allows their population to explode, which is 100% Bingo. true. Bingo. Yep. Yep. Mo unless, you have, unless you have something actively go out and out-compete and then consume it. But are they ever 100% gone, or are they just toned down? I'm going to say... There's a couple of systems that we have tried to find dinos, swap, mm -hmm. swap cultures, and so on and so forth. And, you know, once again, you can only swap so much of a tank. 
but from what we found is we haven't found another dino in the sand and or the rock work. Mm -hmm. And it's probably because of the macrophage bacteria that we allowed to outcompete and then overpopulate the tank. So w what specific bacteria would you recommend or have you used to help help compete it? Well, there's a couple of bacteria that we utilize in the wastewater water uh, water treatment facilities that do uh, active sludge uh, you know, consumption as well as uh, dissolution into the water column. So they take solids, they consume it, and then they pass out dissolved nutrients. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that actually have the big mouths that will go out and actively eat. Um, they're what we call the lytic bacterias, L-Y-T-I-C. Okay. Um, we utilize it in uh, sludge uh, dissolving pretreatments, uh, you know, in wastewater water treatment facilities in order to decompose a lot of the solids in the, in the wastewater. So what better system to do it in than a saltwater system as well, being that, you know, you have organisms that expel waste product, fish, you have corals that also expel waste product, the slime and the excess mucus, and then you also have other, you know, other invertebrates that also do the same. Yeah. Now, does having a, a higher CO2 or a low oxygen environment promote the growth of dinos? Yep, higher levels of CO2 because they need to photosynthesize. They're not just getting their CO2 from the, uh, you know, from themselves, you know, the protist level um, animal, mm -hmm. but it's also getting it from and absorbing it from the CO2 from the water column. Yeah. So one other benefit thing to help doing this is adding extra aeration, whether through, you know, aggressive mm -hmm. skimming, bubbling, different methods like that. Yep, absolutely. I mean, fresh air to your skin is always you know, always a base, mm -hmm. uh, a baseline. A lot of people forget about that, that that's one of the reasons why there is an air intake with that big tube on top saying plug, plug here, you know, fresh air. <laughs> yeah. Um, but a lot of people just uh, leave that rubber tube, you know, sticking inside their, uh, inside their cabinet in mm -hmm. their sub cabinet area. And they're sucking in all that, you know, degas CO2 from the overflow chamber. You know, once it degasses, it releases the CO2 and then you're redissolving it back in. That's kind uh, of counterproductive. Skimmer. Correct. Correct. Now, on this note, another thing I saw come up quite a bit too is it's harder for dinos to grow in a higher pH area. So by sucking in that outside air, you're driving up more CO2 and raising your pH, which will help overall. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I think that that's the correlation that a lot of people uh, mistaken. You know, they're trying to artificially drive it up with alkalinity or adding more alkalinity to it, mm -hmm. uh, making a more basic environment. And, you know, whereas just the oxygenation of driving up the CO2 reduces the acidity of the water naturally mm -hmm. without having to add, you know, additional chemicals. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the most natural way to kind of do it. So uh -huh. heavy aeration definitely helps. Um, dosing other bacteria to help outcompete it seems to be the best mm -hmm. long-term fix. In the short term, you can suck it out, but um, from all the stuff that I've people I've talked to, like avoid doing a water change because that is going to add more nutrients to feed it. So you know, run that siphoning hose, or whatever, through your filter sock, and change your filter sock after. That way, you're not necessarily adding fresh nutrients for it to grow off of. Um, lo long term, Absolutely. yeah, long term fixes, more aeration, and help feeding better bacteria to help out compete it seem to be two of the the biggest things. Mm -hmm. And uh, on a side note, uh, mm -hmm. Dev, you know, when you're actually growing your bacterial army, uh, you know, the two different armies, the one that actually goes out and eats, you also need the one that actually absorbs a lot of the excess nutrients that are being released back into the system. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you end up with uh, what a lot of people see are cyano outbreaks as well as green hair algae outbreaks after they, you know, after they come about the dinos. I actually... And, uh, yeah. I have seen a few people report cyano after, so that does make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've seen other ones with more green hair algae because, once again, those two enjoy a higher CO2 or what we would call a lower, uh, lower oxygenated environment. Mm -hmm. They're able to capitalize on that. Um, you know, it's more or less like a greenhouse in water um, at that point. And they really, really thrive on those type of environments. Cyano doesn't like oxygen. It's uh, one of the byproducts that cyanobacteria also releases is uh, oxygen. Mm -hmm. It's how our uh, how our planet got the, got the atmosphere. It's from cyanobacteria that uh, formed the stromatolites. 
crazy. Yeah, so. See, I learn something new every time we talk. <laughs> uh, so a couple of people are asking, is there any recommended bacteria to dose in the event of it? Like, do you have any specific ones that you would say is useful? Well, the ones that are commercially available, uh, you know, once again, you have the ATM product line. Mm -hmm. So you have the, um, uh, what is it called? The ATM outbreak. That's a good one. Yep. Um, they do a lot of uh, bacterial diversity there. Mm -hmm. And then the other ones that I like is also, you know, Fritz is pretty good as well. You know, they have some. Uh, Microblift mm -hmm. um, is also another good brand. Uh, also, you know, a lot of them stem from the wastewater water treatment uh, facilities. So, mm -hmm. and then lastly, um, the one that we we prefer because they actually have two separate strains of them is the Dr. Tim's one and only, and mm -hmm. then the Dr. Tim's waste away. Waste away one and only. Okay. Uh, some mm -hmm. somebody in the chat was just asking about Microbacter Seven. Mm-hmm. Sim it works. Similar boat. Okay, I haven't used that one yet. <laughs> yeah, but it's it, yeah, it's more of a uh, denitrifying type of bacteria, so it fixes the uh, the excess uh, nitrates in the water. Okay, perfect. So that's so that one would replace, um, in our case, the Dr. Tim's one and only, and then the microphage uh, bacteria that we're talking about, the sludge busting one. Okay. Typically, it's not just the enzymes that uh, that dissolve, and I know that some people only. Uh, package and bottle up the enzymes mm -hmm. that are produced by the bacteria, not necessarily the bacteria themselves. Dr. Tim's does have the active bacteria. Mm -hmm. So you're having these large, you know, I want to call it uh, bacteria with vacuoles that they can actually swallow certain things and solid particulates. That's the one that you want to also outcompete and then consume with antiflagellates. So bit of a question on this one. So we're talking yeah. about certain ones that are nitrate removers, but on the flip mm -hmm. side, I've also heard of dinos happening in a tank where they have next to zero nitrates and phosphate. So people were actually dosing nitrates to try and bring it. Have you had any experience with on that side of it? Like too low of nutrients potentially causing it? Well, I mean, uh, typically dinoflagellates utilize. So if they're already having nutrient issues and the dinoflagellates are sucking it up, Okay. And the, you know the corals are also sucking it up. Mm -hmm. um, they also have a refugium, uh, or some, some type of macroalgae, some type of turf scrubber, so on and so forth. You will experience uh, what we would call a false low, or a false low nutrient level. So you're just testing low utilization. Yeah. So you're cascading the uh, the issue by increasing the nutrients. If you do it rapidly, you'd also want to go ahead and add your bacteria at that time to also be another factor in the cons uh, in the consumption of those excess nutrients. Mm -hmm. And as things dies, you know, as things die, you know, like the um, like the macroalgae, you still want a healthy bacterial population to actually consume it, then get skimmed out by the skimmer. Mm -hmm. Nope, makes sense. Now, so uh, and mm -hmm. oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no. And uh, I was saying, as the dinoflagellates also get consumed, remember they're photosynthetic. Mm -hmm. As you consume them and then you digest them, guess what else is released? More, <laughs> more nutrients back into the water column. So you need something to be there to pick it up in very, very dense quantities or a dense population. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of the nitrifying bacteria come in very, very handy. Okay. Nope, makes sense. And in Yep, and in order to have that dense population, you need to be able to give it all the oxygen that it needs. Okay. So yep. I just want to quickly address this one question that came up because it's a good one. It says mm -hmm. a question, what is dino and how is it different from, say, green hair algae or cyano? <laughs> so, well, once it, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so cyano is a bacteria. Um, dino is a protist and green hair algae is more of a single celled plant like algae. So they're technically mm -hmm. different species in a way. I don't, you might have a more si scientific answer, but. No, you, you, you kind of summed it up uh, very, very well <laughs> and very, very simply. One's an animal, <laughs> which is the protist. Mm -hmm. The other one's a bacteria, which is also a microscopic, uh, you know, microfauna in this case. And then you also have the green hair algae, which is more plant based. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the green hair algae tip, uh, typically tends to anchor, mm -hmm. whereas dinoflagellates and bacteria tend to not. It's kind of blanketed the area more than anything. 
a blanket or it goes up into the into the water column uh, when it's ready. Mm -hmm. And there was someone else was asking, I believe it was the structure, if it was more stringy or like snottish, I think someone mentioned earlier. Um, it generally is. It'll be most times when I've seen it, it's been like little gobs, almost like stringy gobs with little air bubbles in it. That's the easiest way that I can explain it that I've mm -hmm. seen it out there. Yep. Yep. Like mucus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, it's snotty. Snotty. Yeah, that's a good yeah. way to describe it. Um, so you did actually send me the elegance coral dino treatment image. So I'm going to throw that one up for you guys. Because that was a good little graphic on it. Uh, let me just pull, pull this up a bit. All right. So red tanks of dinos by elegant corals. Uh, so modified, I'll also <laughs> add Dr. Tim's waste away. So day one, mm -hmm. one cap or 20 gallons, air bubble uh, next mm -hmm. to return intake, skimmer off. So you turn the skimmer off, eh? Just so it doesn't use up your medication? Oh, no, so it doesn't uh, utilize up uh, or skim out the bacteria. Okay. So skimmer off. So add cap full mm -hmm. Dr. Tim's. Add 2.5 mm -hmm. mil of algae oast. I've never heard of algae oast. Yep. There's a, there's a uh, substitution mm -hmm. uh, underneath the uh, underneath the aeration picture. Okay, so use algae oast that. instead of vodka. Mm -hmm. And instead of bio load, you could also use peroxide. So peroxide's another yep. one. Actually, I've seen a lot of people spot treat it with. Um, mm -hmm. okay, See, so but where we actually dose the uh, where we actually dose the hydrogen peroxide mm -hmm. is into the air intake of the skimmer when it is uh, you know on day four, day five, day six, day seven. Yep. Um, that way you could actually lice you know the bacteria and lice you know any other free floating back. Uh, be able to actually. Uh, I want to call it destroy them, o oxidize them, out. <laughs> destroy them there, and then yeah, oxidize them out and uh, and basically remove it at you know at the point of removal, which is the skimmer. Okay. You know, it removes proteins or protein fragments and pumps it out. Mm -hmm. So would ozone also kill it then if you're running ozone in your skimmer? Because that's essentially hydrogen peroxide is oxidizing stuff within that reaction chamber, right? So would it have a similar effect, or is it doing something different to the page two hundred two would be doing? Chris, cut out on me. Ah, oh, we lost you. Right when I had a good question. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. I'm back. All right, you're back. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So hydrogen peroxide in a skimmer is essentially oxidizing something, like much like ozone. So would running ozone in a skimmer also combat free floating dino flatulence? Yes, yes, it can. Okay. But in, in uh, how do you say, in conjunction with the out competition with the bacteria, because you have to be able to get that excess nutrients somewhere, yep. right? Mm -hmm. The better, pla uh, the best place to actually export, you know, bacteria or excess bacteria as well as the nutrients that they carry is at the skimmer. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. In instead of just broadcast, instead of broadcasting it throughout your entire tank. Mm -hmm. You know, you're removing the nutrients at that one point of the skimmer, as opposed to throughout the, your entire tank and releasing all that nutrients back in, mm -hmm. uh, un uncontrolled, as I call it. Yeah, that's a good point. See, whenever I've ever dosed peroxide, I've always turned off my flow and just spot treated the area that I wanted to kill directly. But doing it through your skimmer, mm -hmm. I mean, it makes sense in a different way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, yep. a few people have also mentioned UV, so killing the free-floating ones, more or less, in your water column, from spreading or landing somewhere else and spreading. Have you, do you have much experience with UV in killing dinos? So UV is one that I have, I have never personally tried. I've seen a few people in the chat say it's worked for them to help help it alongside bacteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, is that, remember, dinoflagellates do go into a modal state and they do disperse into the water column. Mm -hmm. You know, very, very similarly to bacteria. Bacteria is not just only on the surface of things. They also might migrate to the water column. You know, once the uh, population density is reached, mm -hmm. it wants to be able to move and recolonize somewhere else. I think we spoke about that in the, in the previous stream that we had. Yep. Bacteria, dinoflagellates, things always like to move to an area of opportune environments mm -hmm. or better. Or, um, uh, let's see, how do you say it? Yeah, better environments for it to actually increase its population. Yeah. So, um, yeah, dinoflagellates, if it's uh, free-moving and it's in the water column, UV is 
uh, the UV sterilizer will catch. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I've seen that one come up in a few times in the chat so far, so I just want to address that one. Uh, so yeah. Cole Martin Marine was asking, what's your view on reef bio as a bioavailable carbon replacing vodka method? That is Brightwell's version. Uh, never personally used it, but there may be more to it. But generally, vodka, sugar, vinegar, no pox, they're all very similar. Yeah. And they're all just... And vitamin C. Yeah. And, and vitamin C. Never tried that one either. Or vitamin C. But they're all basically a different carbon source that you're using to feed and grow the bacteria in your tank. They may have some other bacteria or stuff mixed into it. I don't know. But that is essentially what they're all accomplishing. So I, I can't say if that works any better or any different than the other ones, but it's a similar idea. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, we, we've seen no pox. Uh, we've substituted no pox for uh, vodka. We substituted mm -hmm. um, algae outs for, uh, for vodka. Mm -hmm. We substituted a lot of other things for additional carbon dosing or different forms of carbon dosing. Yeah. So yes, it does help. Perfect. Um, so definitely helps. I mean, as for which product you use, mm -hmm. honestly, I think it's personal preference. If you vodka, vinegar, no pox, biofuel, mm -hmm. they're all accomplishing the yeah. same thing. Absolutely. And uh, once again, you know, while you're doing the carbon dosing, go ahead and add that extra, you know, one and only fritz, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. nice bacteria that you guys decide to buy. Go ahead and dose that first before you actually add the carbon dosing turn off your skimmer so that you don't just suck out all that money that you just put back in <laughs> <laughs> yeah no kidding that was no that was a great great point from last week's stream of actually dosing beneficial bacteria that you want in your system when you are dosing something like a carbon source because then you're helping to grow it and get the good stuff to thrive in your system and create more of that biodiversity so absolutely end end of the day to kind of sum it up i think that out competing using more of a bacteria product is a really good way to outcompete dinos is basically get the bacteria to steal its food source so it can't thrive with it mm -hmm. um, and somebody somebody also mentioned reef bugs as well yeah so yeah that would also be another one they also do have bacterial strains that are desiccated and when you actually add water to it the bacterial population does uh, rehydrate and mm -hmm. it does start multiplying so yeah that's also another uh, delivery method to actually getting the bacterial population you know, or the healthy bacterial population back up. Okay, I'm actually just reading a quick thing about it. I've never actually used a reef bugs. Natural invertebrate fruit contains 12 strains of live marine microbes. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yes, sir. Hatch in 30 minutes. That's kind of cool. Never used that one. Good to know. Yeah. Have you tried it? <laughs> yes. Does it work? Yes, we have. Does it work? Does it work well? It, it, it does, but it's a little slower. Okay. It doesn't hatch and work in 30 minutes? Oh. <laughs> no, whereas, uh, whereas in the liquid form already, um, and, you know, it's already in that state of, uh, I want to say, hibernation. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is just put the right nutrients in front of it, enough warmth, enough light, and it goes to town. Okay. Or, sorry, enough nutrients and enough uh, oxygen. Yeah, because so once it goes anaerobic, it goes it goes into a hibernating state. Um throw this one out there since you're saying that with enough oxygen mm -hmm. if you guys are doing any form of carbon dosing adding that extra aeration goes a long way because as that bacteria expands it's going to absorb the oxygen which is going to create more carbon dioxide in your tank so doing more aer aeration to force out that co2 goes a long way to helping those bacteria and helping your tank thrive um so yep. someone else was just asking off topic but i've heard about this vitamin c dosing anyone else seen anything about it so you mentioned yes. that when we were talking about carbon dosing. So is vitamin C mm -hmm. a form of carbon? Yes. Okay. Now, on an unrelated note, I've heard people doing this supposedly saying it helps zoas in some way or other. I've never done vitamin C dosing. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other info on it? Um, it's typically uh, why we also take vitamin C when we have a cold. Yeah. It also boosts the immune system, uh, the immunity um, you know, in your overall system, you know, we treat our tanks like a, you know, like a patient. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if we see that it's struggling, it's under stress, so on and so forth, we try to give it everything that it needs or everything that we believe it needs. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's, you know, we're doing our best. We're doing our best to keep this, this, uh, glass box on life support. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, any any vitamins, vitamin supplements would also help, you know, a lot of your organisms in your tank, also the bacterial population as well. So, yep, definitely, uh, definitely interesting and, uh, you know, trying to treat the, the overall tank as a human body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, one yeah. that was mentioned earlier was hydrogen peroxide. Mm-hmm. The general mm-hmm. safety-ish dose of it is about one mil per 10 gallons. Um, that, mm-hmm. that is one you don't want to overdose because it can become toxic to an extent to like fish's gills and other things mm-hmm. if it's too much concentration. Mm-hmm. But the general, yeah. I guess, hobbyist accepted value of not having an issue is one mil per 10 gallons. So let's throw that out there if anyone goes down that road. Would it be, Absolutely. I'm assuming it's probably similar regardless of dosing it in the skimmer or somewhere else? Kind of stick to that ratio or is it a little more forgiving because it's being used up directly in the skimmer? It's uh, being utilized up a little bit more directly in the skimmer. Okay. And that's where it's dwelling. Um, a lot of the times, um, how, do you, how do you put it so simply? Um, yeah, basically, uh, once again, hydrogen peroxide is non-discriminatory when it comes down to catalyst or reacting with membranes, you know, living membranes, tissue, like the fish gills and corals. And, you know, one of the reasons why we try to dose it only at the skimmer is, you know, that's where it's going to supercharge. That's where it's going to interact with high contact time Mm -hmm. with a lot of the uh, bacteria and other, you know, microorganisms that end up into the uh, skimmer cone. And that's the, that's the shortest route to being exported. Does that make sense? Yep. That makes sense. So, so you try not to let it dwell too much in, you know, in broadcast dosing, mm-hmm. you know, throughout your tank. And that's one of the reasons why we do it there. That's why we also put ozone there. Yeah. So it's, it's sure. a much safer place and you're getting more bang for your buck by dosing it in this skimmer, which is your reaction chamber, mm-hmm. essentially. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And, and as you know, when, uh, when you turn on the ozone, you notice that your uh, protein skimmer um, goes into uh, uh, overdrive or mm-hmm. turbo. Um, same thing with the uh, hydrogen peroxide. You add a little bit of uh, hydrogen peroxide to the air intake of your skimmer, it pulls in the hydrogen peroxide, mm-hmm. gets mixed up into the water stream, and then you'll notice that your protein skimmer also goes to turbo, mm-hmm. and it starts foaming really, really you know, actively. Yeah. So actually, here's another good question. Now, if you're dosing any of these bacteria mm-hmm. or other stuff to your tank, doing a wet skim mm-hmm. versus a dry skim, does it have a big impact either way on it? Or is it more just the fact that you're getting all that aeration and, and sucking stuff out? Well, yeah, we always do a dry skim. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, when we're doing it. Even if we're doing a lot of the, um, you know, the dinoflagellate regimen, green hair algae regimen, cyano regimen, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. We notice that a dry skim, you know, typically tends to, you know, build up around the neck a little bit more. Yeah. So some people don't want to clean the neck that often, mm-hmm. but it's for me when it's in a solid form. I know that I'm not wasting my water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I go for a, a very dry skim. I never do a wet skim. I like then and I can go like a month before I have to mm-hmm. do my skimmer and you know make it work for that crud. Yep. So, yep. Absolutely. Okay. And another and another funny thing about dinoflagellates is remember the zooxanthella themselves are a are a flagellate. Mm-hmm. They do tend to migrate, and they also get expelled by corals. And we've also found a couple of instances where we where you found dino in corals. Oh, cut out again. <laughs> All right, so so corals expel zooanthellae, and I know you could also have. You were saying before dinos. Is it? I don't know if it's expelling directly from the coral or mixed in with the zooanthellae. But they are one of those things that is in every system, and it's one of those things that will potentially come out if your tank's too out of whack and things aren't in balance. Mel's aquatic. Uh, any questions? Thanks, Lisa. You are a superstar in the chat. Um, just to throw it out, since Lisa was saying it, um, if you guys do have any questions, uh, reaptease.com slash ask. This is actually today's stream would brought this up just because I had a couple people ask me about this in the past week or two. So I figured it was a good topic for a stream. So if you guys do you want something you want us to do a stream on, reaptease.com slash ask, throw it up there and yeah, a good chance if enough people ask about it, it'll turn to a live stream. 
So I'm kind of curious, any of you guys in the chat, have any of you battled with dinos and won? And if so, what has worked for you? Uh, who is Devin talking to? This is Mr. Cruz from Elegance Corals. He is the one in the background. And yeah, he's been in the, he works in waste management and automation and works with Elegance Corals. So he's been all over this type of stuff. So he's, he's a, a great resource for any type of like bacteria and a lot of these different funky things. Thanks for the stream. No problem. Thanks for hopping on. What's going on, Rogue Aquariums? So if any of you guys have done anything different strategies than stuff we've talked about today, I'd love to hear about it too. Because as with most things in the hobby, there's, you know, 20 different ways to accomplish the same thing. What about cotton candy algae? Is that a real algae? I have to look this up now. I've never heard of cotton candy algae. Huh. That actually looks kind of nice. Didn't recognize the voice. Yep. See you later, Lisa. Thanks for hopping on as always. I have never dealt or seen cotton candy algae before. I'll have to do a bit of research on this one. Uh, where can we find the write-up you showed earlier? Um, I will post that to the Facebook page or the Facebook group, one of the two. Um, if you guys aren't on there, let me draw up a quick link for you and I will post that diagram. Oops. All right, so there's a link to the Facebook group. If you guys are on there, join it. Um, I'm going to post that up on the page. And yeah, if any questions on it, let me know. Uh, can, if anyone ever used Vibrant to eliminate dinos, I've used Vibrant on hair algae as well as bubble algae. I have not tried it on dinos, so I can't speak to that one. Uh, will dosing bacteria outcompete dinos? Yes, it definitely can. That's one of the big things we we're talking about today. Uh, where can we find the write up? Uh, Mexican turbo snails, those guys are ferocious algae eaters. They work very well on hair algae. Now, what, one thing I did mention earlier dinos, not T Rexes, but the, the dino flagellates in your tank. Um, that one. It can be toxic, so if you do see clumps of it, it is a good idea to remove it from your tank. I have seen cases where people have tried to counter it with a cleanup crew, and then they wiped out their cleanup crew from the toxins from it. So something to keep in mind about it. And I think that is everything we got. Any other questions? Uh, Mexican turbo snails for cotton candy LG. Good question, that one. I cannot help you on that one. I do not know. I've never had cotton candy before or even seen it until I Googled it two seconds ago. All right, guys. I think that one's going to wrap it up today. If you guys enjoyed it, smash that like button. If you have any future questions, go to reefdews.com slash ask. Send it in and probably turn to a future live stream. If it's a simple question, I'll just email you back right away. All right, everybody. Thanks for hopping on today.